a London taxi. Because <laughs> it would only do a certain speed. The Nürburgring was the most satisfying racetrack you could ever have. I mean, 187 corners per lap when I was doing it. Now there's not 187 corners. It's wider today. It's got less jumps in it today. At one time we had 13 jumps at the Nürburgring. Um, but it was by far the most exciting, the most satisfying, but also the most challenging circuit that's ever been made in the world. Um, but it simply wasn't practical any longer to race in Formula One in the manner in which the organizers, the track owners, could not go to the length that was required. <laughs> Keep in mind that uh, the length, 40.7 miles long, I don't remember the, the number of kilometers. You've got to double that because it's both sides of the road. So firefighting, you know, medical help, all the things that have to be catered for today just was no longer capable in those days. It just had to stop. And I unfortunately was the president of the Grand Prix Drivers Association and it was me who stopped the Nürburgring, which was a very unpopular thing from the media as well as from the general public because in those days, the Nürburgring, there were 350,000 people came to the Nürburgring. They came for a whole weekend because both sides of the racetracks, they were having barbecues every night. They were drinking more beer than they had ever done in their life. So it was a big thing also for tourism in the Eiffel region of Germany. So it was a very unpopular decision to, to stop Formula One and, and Nürburgring. But it had to be done because keep in mind that in 1968, we lost a driver. The driver was killed. From the 1st of April with Jim Platt, 1st of May was Ludovico Scarfiotti, no, Mike Spence, then Ludovico Scarfiotti, and then uh, Joe Slesser. To have our family, if you like, and it was a small family because we traveled together, we holidayed together, we, we were a very tight group of people. To have all of those people killed one a month, and the Nürburgring was in August the fifth month and I won the race that was that one with fog and rain I won it by over four minutes and the first question I asked Ken Tittle was is everybody all right because in the Nürburgring you wouldn't know a car goes off the road and goes down and you don't know it it's extraordinary in those days so uh, it was a love-hate relationship was the biggest challenge that you could ever have driving a racing car. But every time I left my home, I always looked in the mirror and I wondered whether I would be coming back, you know, to see my home. Uh, it was that bad. And yet, it was so amazingly satisfying to put in a good lap. First of all, in, in 69, uh, the, the Matra turned out to be a very nice car to drive. Um, it was fairly long wheelbase, uh, which is much better than a short wheelbase car, which I drove later. The Tyrrells were very short wheelbase and therefore more difficult to drive. The Matra was, let's call it an easier car to drive. But uh, the great thing about that period was we were all using the Ford Cosworth engine. And it meant that, you know, there was more relevance to the driver because nobody had more power than the other. So it was a great season. The car was very good. Matra's engineering was excellent. Then the mechanics that Ken Tyrrell had were really the best, the very best. In fact, uh, three of them are still with me, still alive. And I always tell everybody that those three people, I'm here because of them. Because I didn't have mechanical failures. I didn't have wheels fall off. So they really allowed me to live until I'm now 80 years of age. And it's ironic that the matter, that's, it's 80, MS 80. <laughs> So uh, it's got many happy memories. Well, 
in, in those days, of course, you must remember that we didn't just drive Formula One. We, we drove sports cars, GT cars, Indy cars, uh, Can-Am cars, every kind of car that was raced, Formula Two cars, at the same time. And today's drivers really don't understand that. They do 21 races. And of course there's uh, simulator work, but that's not the same as having to race every weekend more than one car. Sometimes I, I did, I remember I raced four different cars in one race, one weekend, I mean one, one day. Um, so therefore we were more versatile we, and we were learning more from different mechanics, different engineers, different tyre people, because one time you'd be with Dunlop, the next time you'd be with Goodyear or Firestone, etc. So it, it was a more, I think, educational period. And you learned a great deal from all these other people. So when I went back into Formula One, you know, whenever that race was in two weeks' time or three weeks' time, because then sometimes there was only 11 Grand Prix races. And, you know, there wasn't the same amount of money that, for example, the drivers of today have. Um, but to earn that money, America was one of the most important places we had to go. And in 1971, when I won the World Championship, I went, I crossed the Atlantic 86 times because I was doing television for ABC's Wide World of Sports. I was with Ford Motor Company. I was with Goodyear Tan Rubber Company. I was racing in Can-Am. I was racing in Formula 2 and Formula 1 and touring cars and GT cars. You know, I drove one for Ferrari, for example, to secure the World Championship for sports cars in 67. And, and all of that was educational for me because I was learning or other people had never experienced before. And with the best engineers in every team that I ever went to. So it, it was a, a different world, really. Well, I thank everyone. I thank the producers who created this, as well as the people who have bought. And they're beautiful items. A big thank you, because Helen, my wife of 57 years, uh, has dementia. It's a terrible illness. Uh, we have seven neuro nurses looking after Helen now. I can afford that, very few people can. So we're trying to find a way of finding a cure for dementia, but even more importantly, preventive medicine for dementia in the years that are ahead of us. We're getting young PhDs who are the best in every part of the world. We've got to change the culture because for 30 years, nobody's found a cure for dementia. I would love to do it in my lifetime. If not, I want it done for race against dementia because it's a terrible illness for people and the cost of, for a family is shocking. So it's now the most expensive illness in the world for anybody to have. It costs more money to keep a, uh, and a dementia patient than it does from the combined total of cancer and heart disease. And the suggestion is that the people born today, one in three are gonna have dementia. So we have to find a cure. So that's why I'm very grateful for everybody who's purchasing these lovely, lovely items. And uh, let's hope we find a cure. I'm going to hang it. Um, I have a lovely collection of pictures to do with my motor racing and it will certainly be amongst them the best place. It was a fantastic race. I mean, with Jochen and with Belfast and Bruce McLaren, you know, anything could have happened. But the part of parabolic, I knew what to do. And we had a gear ratio that took me across the line before I had to change gear. And that won the race. And, you know, I never bothered about pole positions. It wasn't important in those days because we all had the same engine. It was very normal. But uh, to get the gear, the gear ratio for Monza right, we spent two and a half days getting it right. And that's what won the race.